Okay, I think we can start. Um, I am Rosaria Pisa, I am the Director of Gender and Women's Studies. Um, I want to welcome you to the second Dana Sugar uh, Colloquium lecture this year. And it also, it is a pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for today. Okay, thank you. Donna Hughes um, is a professor in gender and women's studies and sociology and anthropology and holds the Eleanor M. and Oscar Carlson Endowed Chair. Dr. Hughes has been active in the global anti-sex trafficking for 30 years and has researched sex trafficking in the US, Russia, and the Ukraine. She wrote the first reports on the use of internet um, for trafficking women and girls for the Council of Europe. And she has been active in drafting and lobbying for new legislation on sex trafficking at the federal and state level. In 2010, Dr. Hughes won the Josephine Butler Award for, cha quote, for challenging the status quo in creating new abolitionist policy or approach to sex trafficking in the US. In the same year, she won the University of Rhode Island Council, um, Research Council Annual Research Award. She has been honored for her work by being invited to the White House to witness the signing of three federal laws on human trafficking. Dr. Hughes has developed and taught new undergraduate and graduate courses on human trafficking and supervised a research group, a student research group, that is researching cases of human trafficking and prostitution in Rhode Island. I welcome you, Dr. Hughes. We also welcome Dr. Praveen Patkar to URI. He comes to us from Mumbai, India. Very different climate there right now, probably. Dr. Very Patkar different. is currently a Fulbright Scholar uh, with Gender and Women's Studies. Dr. Patkar holds a PhD in Sociology from Mumbai University and has held several academic positions and directorships of distinction. Like Dr. Hughes, his research and advocacy work is in the area of human trafficking. He has served as director of the Anti-Trafficking Resource Center in Mumbai and is the co-founder and co-director of Prerana, an anti-human trafficking organization that provides essential services like education, meals, and housing for children of prostitutes. And I'm sure he will share uh, some of that work with us today. Dr. Patkar's work against trafficking has been recognized by the U.S., having been nominated by the U.S. government for the global position as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Trafficking. Dr. Patkar has a long list of service with other international bodies, boards, commissions, and agencies. We are honored to have Dr. Patkar here at URI and, and to support his important work. I would like to welcome now both Dr. Hughes and Dr. Patka to the podium and share with us their research and perspectives on sex trafficking in the United States and India. Thank you, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Patka. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we're going to start with just a little bit of locating where we are, oh my, that's really burnt out, okay, but uh, yes. the uh, map of Asia and uh, Dr. Pat Carr can help orient you to uh, where India is. Yep. This is the Indian subcontinent. South Asia is generally also called as Indian subcontinent because India plays a very important role in terms of its strategic location and sharing borders with Pakistan, Afghanistan, here, Tibet, China, Nepal, Bangladesh, very close to Myanmar. This is India. It's uh, divided into several states, 30 plus states. It's a kind of a federal body. We are located here. This is Mumbai, west coast of India. 
and we are located in this city which has 1% of the Indian population. One in every 100 Indians live in this city. This is the industrial capital of India. Yep. Okay. And I hope that all of you know where Rhode Island is located uh, in the United States and I hope you could find it on the map of North America and the globe but I just thought uh, we're, try we're trying to you know, do a comparison here so I thought I'd remind you where you are too. Okay. All right. It is very important to understand visually what the difference in context is. When you look at Bombay or Mumbai, Mumbai is its current name, Bombay is its temporary name after the British arrival. This is what it looks like. First thing you have to understand is that it's, it's a country state with resource crunch. Bombay has a toxic environment. It's, it's characterized by congestion, high population density, crowd everywhere living conditions are subhuman, basic amenities are missing in most of the cases, there is no open space there, highly uh, inegalitarian kind of, it is a very cosmopolitan, very secular city, very accommodative city. At the same time, it gives you the extremes of some of the richest people live there whose names are there in the Forbes list and then this has the largest number of people who are living below the poverty line. This is, this is where, I mean, this is specifically where we work. Last 30 years we have been working and I would come more particularly to what it is like, but this is, this is the way you know, it looks from a bird's eye view. This is a street where the sex trade actually operates and there are streets and streets like this. During the daytime you can see so much of crowd and both the building, the lines of building that you can see on, on both the sides, uh, they house several brothels on the ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor, everywhere you will find. In some cases, the ground floor, the first, the shops, there may be shops in the front line and brothels in the back. Daytime also the trade goes. Daytime also you can see girls waiting outside, some customers coming, having fun with them, finally settling with somebody. But this is the regular picture much in, and try to understand this. This is the contrast here. You can see those girls ready, available 24 hours standing outside because there is no place to sit inside. There is the only place they belong to is this or alternatively if they have nothing by way of soliciting, then they will be belonging to the road that you see in front. These are the girls who are getting ready around 4, 4 o'clock around this time. They will be painting themselves because by 5, 5.30 they will be standing and soliciting for customers outside. So they are busy preparing themselves for the series of rapes that they will be facing that night. There is no place to sit. This is the congested area. On one bench, six, seven girls would sit together and make themselves up. And uh, this, is the, this is the place. After some time, they will be driven out because that place will be then given to the customers to come and wait. This brothel keeper is sitting and supervising whether all those girls are actually making themselves attractive and inducing uh, somebody to get into prostitution with them or not. Very young girls as you can see, good 40, 40 percent when we started the work, good 40 percent of the prostituted women in that area. This is the largest red light area of the Asian continent. And there were, a, uh, there were estimates, several estimates saying that the number of women who are actually prostituted there could be anything around 100,000. Okay. Young girls from all over, young girls from all over the country and the other South Asian countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, sometimes Sri Lanka, they all are trafficked to this city and uh, this is where they belong. There is no, uh, I will perhaps add something by way of saying that this is, this is where they are, this is not their home, this is not their family, this is not their abode, they, they belong to the street, this is their business workstation. And as long as they have work, they will be there, otherwise they will be driven out. This place has, they cannot cook their food, there is no place to sleep there till the customers and the business is over. So they go to sleep by around 3.30 in the morning when the business goes slow. Night time scene, the area is more active at night time and as I say, there are hundreds of thousands of visitors coming and visiting this place every night. Again some women 
here you see little grown up women, but they are not free from that. One very interesting thing is that when I say that 40% or around that number is that of women who are below 18 years of age as of a given point of time, that does not mean that the rest were not child prostitutes. If you ask this question to the rest of the women who are around 40, 42, 45 today, they would also confirm that they were trafficked into prostitution when they were 11, 12, 13, 14. So if you put that figure together, it's 85% to 90% of women who were actually got into this business when they were much below 16 years of age, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we want to talk about different types of response uh, to this problem. And uh, when you talk in the uh, international context, you refer to a government as the state. So we're going to review sort of the state or government response to sex trafficking. And there, uh, almost all states, I think all states and governments have at some time passed a law uh, banning sex trafficking. There are many laws and international agreements have been signed to prevent trafficking and slavery in the last 150 years. So many laws. So laws have been created to criminalize sex trafficking, created uh, penalties for the violation of the law, and uh, prosecution of sex traffickers. Uh, there's been a criminal justice response which the state is uh, responsible for and has been very uneven uh, throughout the world. Um, to talk about the Indian law? Okay, the Indian situation is a little different. We have what is called as a federal law or central law, that is Immoral Traffic into Bracket Prevention Act, ITPA, that was passed first in 1956 in the response to the 1949 United Nations Convention on, uh, on Trafficking. Subsequently, in 1956, it was passed. It was called as Suppression in Trafficking of Women and Girls. So it was called CETA, now it has changed to PETA. And in the, in the year 1986, it was majorly amended. This is one central law. The state governments, we have a federal structure. The state governments have their own laws, particularly pertaining to the type of prostitution. Because in Indian situation, uh, there, is, uh, there is one type of prostitution, which is, which is customary prostitution, which is traditional prostitution, which is religious oriented prostitution, which is very often found as temple based prostitution. The temples belonging to variety of religions, but predominantly Hindu religion, the prostitution trade is very closely linked with the business of temples. And therefore, it has a kind of a ritual status. We will come to that a little more in details. But for regarding that, banning that right from 1911, 1924, 1934, during the British time, we became independent in the year 1947. Subsequent to that, state governments have been passing laws because these are very specific, locally specific phenomena, and therefore, the laws are also very specific. That kind of law we have. We have laws against trafficking for labor. They are not a part of traffic, uh, the common trafficking law. We have something separate for bonded labor, 1976 Act. We have something 1986 against child labor. We have something against human trans, trans uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Transplantation of Human Organs Act. That is again a uh, separate act. Like that, we have separate act specifically addressing to the difference in trafficking or different destinations of human trafficking. Okay, I, as I said, uh, we have uh, laws, international agreements, and laws banning slavery in the United States, but it wasn't until 2009 uh, when U.S. Congress passed a federal law uh, called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act that gave a modern definition to not only forced labor but to sex trafficking. And there have been subsequent laws passed to, uh, to update it, but also now I think every state in the United States, including Rhode Island, uh, has a state law against uh, sex trafficking as well. And uh, in Rhode Island, uh, they passed a, the first law against uh, sex trafficking in 2007, and then it was updated significantly in 2009. Okay, uh, rather than give just the uh, Indian definition of uh, sex trafficking and, or the United States, we thought we would sort of stay neutral and give the United Nations uh, definition of human trafficking uh, uh, which is called the, uh, you know, it's a universal definition of trafficking. And although uh, there are variations in uh, how things are defined, uh, the laws against human trafficking are really pretty universal uh, throughout the world now. The United Nations uh, law is called the Palermo Protocol because in the United Nations, they always like to give things a really long name, and so they have to come up with something short to call it. Uh, and it was signed in Palermo, Italy. So they've started calling these different uh, conventions and tools that are, that are signed uh, uh, by the name of the place they were signed. 
and the, it's the, um, called the uh, Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Persons, Especially Women and Children. And it's part of a larger Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. And it was passed in 2000, the same year that the, uh, the U.S. federal government passed a new human trafficking law. And I'm going to read you this basic definition. It is uh, more detailed than this, but I want you to just uh, pay attention to the uh, red words that I've uh, highlighted and underlined, that they're the sort of the most central parts of the law. And trafficking in persons means the recruitment, the transportation, the transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or, or use of force or other forms of coercion of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or the position of vulnerability, uh, or the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation shall, as a minimum, mean the exploitation of the prostitution of others and other forms of sexual exploitation. So b the ba very basic definition is that if you uh, coerce, force, or trick an adult person into prostitution, you are committing the crime of sex trafficking. Also, if you recruit, transport, transfer, harbor, or receive a child for the purpose of sexual exploitation, that is by definition sex trafficking. N uh, no force, fraud, or coercion uh, are necessary. This is the largest red light area of Bombay, Kamatipura red light area, night shot. It is very active. All these lanes are full of sex trade and hundreds of thousands of women being sold every night and lots of people visiting these lanes till past midnight. You can see the crowd nighttime shot. People have a lot of choice. They come and select the product and then they will walk into the cubicles or they will take the girl out for the whole night. And uh, well, this is where in, in this very crowd you will find the children of prostitutes trying to find a place to sleep. And they don't get it till it is past midnight. Okay, but switching to Rhode Island, uh, the closest thing that we have to a uh, sex industry area is Allen's Avenue, where there are a number of strip clubs, uh, adult bookstores, and a number of clubs in this particular building. And uh, Cheaters, uh, which is a strip club, was the site in which there was a victim of sex trafficking found and the case is now being prosecuted. Other popular locations where you'd find victims of sex trafficking uh, are in hotels and motels around the airport and along I-95. Also, some of the um, more popular places where sex, vi sex trafficking victims are held and used are in residences. This is an p actual picture of um, a residence in which they found several girls captive uh, that were brought here from Massachusetts. So residence and apartments are used. Also, some of the places that uh, were locations of prostitution in Rhode Island were the massage parlors. Uh, because of the laws passed in 2009 and subsequent ordinances from uh, in Providence and one pending in Pawtucket, almost all of the uh, massage parlors have been shut down. There are a few uh, still around. I think all of these that I uh, uh, have pictures of here are now gone. But one of the things you probably notice about them is that they just look very average, very average looking places. These are the kind of the places you just drive by. And when I, people would express their surprise that we had sex trafficking in Rhode Island, they would say, well, where? And I would say, you probably drive past the places every day uh, because they look so, um, so ordinary. The upper uh, right-hand corner one there is Queen Spa, which is at the top of 138 uh, with the intersection of Route 1. It was now uh, closed down, I think, about a year ago. But very strip club or strip malls, um, you know, just average looking places. And even if some people notice the name spa, they may think it's just a place you go for massages. Okay. This is a very special feature about India or subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, South Asia, or in other countries uh, of Asia. Uh, 
including Thailand, you will find the same thing. There are various sources from where victims are inducted or trafficked into the trade. And uh, this has a lot to do with the colonial legacy, the British. India was a British colony. A part of India was also a French colony, Puducherry, Pondicherry. And because of certain requirements of their time and because of certain instruments passed by them, certain types of population, sectors of population became easily available as victims for the sex trade of the metropolitan areas. Let me talk to you, let me tell you something about these criminal tribes. When the British came to India, they wanted to start trade. They didn't want to do good governance there. Basically, they were looking for resources and good trade. And they realized that the trade routes were very unsafe and there were uh, you know, cases of serious crime happening. And therefore, a special officer was appointed and uh, complete repression of the criminal gangs. Now, these were not criminal gangs. The, there were two types of people. There were kingdoms, chiefdoms, princedoms who immediately or after a little bit of resistance gave in to the British power. But there were small little groups who, who were self-reliant, who were autonomous, who were living in forests, who were living in the remote, away, remote areas. They did not give in so easily. And then it was, it was declared that these are all criminal tribes. And in the year 1871, a law was passed declaring something like 171 communities as born criminals, as addicted to crime, crime and as that they have a tendency, propensity to keep committing non bailable offenses. That was the law. This law was changed and made an all Indian law in 1920, 1924. And people were made, the men were made to report to the nearest police station every day or minimally three times in a week. They were given areas where they were not supposed to be seen outside. No member of the community would be seen outside. Being spotted outside of a given zone itself would be a crime. And the magistrate and the entire judiciary was so inclined to think that the fact that a person is a member of an, a criminal tribe, no more proof is required. That itself was good enough. Now, that resulted in breaking of the family and the local dominant people and dominant caste. India has a caste system which is a kind of a closed social stratification system where there is no mobility from one caste to another possible. You are born in a caste, you die in a caste. And your relations and your occupations and your opportunities all your life are determined by the caste in which you are born. Okay. So there were upper caste people who wanted to make use of the women belonging to the lower caste. And this law was used very liberally to take the men and put them in prison. And then look at what how these women would be able to manage their households. Very soon these women would become available for prostitution by the main caste. So Criminal Tribes Act has played a havoc. And even today you find a number of communities in Northwest India where girls are born to become prostitutes. Only 2 to 5 percent of girls have a choice to get married and settle into a family. 95 percent of the girls are bought. The father is a pimp, the mother is a prostitute, and the daughter is prepared from the age of 11 years to entertain customers in the uh, main capital city's businesses. So this is how a major part of non-religious, non-religious customary or evil customary prostitution source is maintained. There is a second thing, and that is Deva Dasi. Deva means God, Dasi means slave. In, a, in three different parts of India, there is a tradition whereby girls uh, who have not started their periods, prepubescent girls, are dedicated to gods, goddesses, deities, temples, and objects of worship. And practically, in the name of service to God, they become public women, and they are used by the, gen by the important people, the elites in the village for some time. After four or five years of use, they are thrown into the city red light areas. So that has been a major source. The third part of that was also, yeah, very peculiar thing is, here you will realize that these victims belong to, belong to the lowest caste. They belong to the lowest class. They are also at a disadvantageous position on the gender hierarchy. They have no political organization. They have no support groups. They have no, uh, they have no education whatsoever, no literacy. So you can see all types of discriminatory hierarchical orders conspire against them at the lowest end. And that is what is the 100% of these Devadasis belong to untouchable caste. The users are the top class or top caste people, the Brahmins, the pure, pure Brahmins who belong to the topmost caste, who practice untouchability in the most strictest manner. But when it comes to having sex with the woman, the, they have created a kind of a tradition as if momentarily this girl is considered as very divine and very sacred and therefore the man can have sex with her. So they are a major source of victims 
uh, of course now it is now it is not a major source because now the market is very open there was a time when the society waited for some kind of a legitimacy some kind of an excuse to pick up some girl and bring her into the trade or to go to her and make, you make use of her times have changed now people don't wait for any kind of legitimacy as long as they have anonymity that is good enough for them to use any woman anywhere and now we have women coming from anywhere and all over and we have men coming and using them in the marketplaces thank you okay among the sources of victim once again remember much in dark, direct contrast to the us you will find that uh, whenever there is a natural disaster any kind of ecological crisis tsunami earthquake anything like that you find that immediately now for example two years ago there was an earthquake in nepal you might have heard about it we had so much in 2005 we had asian tsunami there was a huge trafficking so ecological crisis droughts economic depression industrial depression agricultural uh, crisis cross border trafficking because we share borders with bangladesh nepal and the bangladesh india border is something like 4000 km border which is porous which is open which is disputed and therefore there is a good thoroughfare currently we are studying indo nepal border the same thing is happening so this is where we have victims coming from within india so as again in contrast to us i must say india is a source of trafficking where from girls have come right up to the bay area of san francisco here india is a destination People, you know we have girls coming from tashkent uzbekistan to be, to bombay now and india is a transit bangladeshi myanmar girls cut cut through india enter pakistan go up to turkestan and settle in middle east when i say that pre pubescent girls are dedicated in the name of god and actually for the sex trade look at this girl this girl has must have been dedicated ritually a year ago this is the time now she is about to start her menses and therefore there is going to be a open official deflowering ceremony and whoever bids the highest will have the right to use her for the first night he will maintain her for some days and then he will start sharing her with others look at her age this is very particularly important because when we talk about women doing prostitution voluntarily this is the question one must ask when 85% of them come when they were below 16 years of age which is legally the age of consent what kind of consent have they given and if they are dedicated to this kind of an work when they had not even started their periods this is the child predator this is not a kind of an open free trade okay then turning back to Rhode Island we think about where do the victims of sex trafficking come from we have no institutional sources of victims as dr pat car has just described in in india where there is actually institutions set up to deliver uh, girls into into prostitution um, but we do have a wide tolerance and advocacy for prostitution throughout the united states uh, and and in rhode island as well uh, many of the victims in rhode island are from rhode island this is what's called domestic trafficking uh, and they're, they're rhode island girls being trafficked often by rhode island pimps and sex traffickers there are some of the victims uh, in rhode island that come from other states a, a lot of of the girls come from massachusetts it seems to be one of the most popular uh, sources of of teen girls also from new york indiana and, and texas once again these are us citizen girls um, that are being used in rhode island we also have foreign victims uh, foreign women uh, there were a lot of korean almost uh, women in the massage parlors almost all the uh, massage parlors that uh, were around here were run by koreans and uh, in 2006 there was a federal case from the eastern district of new york that documented the smuggling transportation and trafficking of uh, Korean women throughout the east coast of the United States and particularly into Rhode Island. Uh, there have also been cases of pandering, which is pimping, uh, from, with pimps from Mexico and Central America, but we have not yet had a sex trafficking case uh, uh, concerning victims from these areas. Some of the most popular victims in Rhode Island, um, or I shouldn't say most popular, some of the most numerous victims in, uh, in Rhode Island are teen girls who've run away uh, either from home or from group homes. And we're realizing that the, the, vi that the, that the pimps, the sex traffickers, are targeting these victims. They know who they are, and they are specifically targeting them because they are emotionally vulnerable. 
Some of the victims are kidnapped. Uh, we have cases in which there's just outright kidnapping. But we also have cases with some victims in which the pimps act as boyfriends. And they coerce the women and girls into prostitution after they have their loyalty uh, by pretending to love them. So that's the uh, general source of victims uh, in Rhode Island. As far as cases of sex trafficking in Rhode Island, in 2009, there was a comprehensive, comprehensive human trafficking law passed. Uh, and a prostitution law passed at the same time that enabled investigations into sex trafficking, which had, had not been able to occur before. If you, you can ask more questions about that because a lot of people don't understand why that was. And from 2009 to present, there have been about 40 arrests uh, for sex trafficking. Uh, we well, have an undergraduate research group which has collected police and court documents of cases from 2009 to 2013. And I'm proud to say that just within the last two weeks, they've gotten notice that uh, a paper that they wrote called Analysis of, Analysis of Cases of Human Trafficking in Rhode Island from 2009 to 2013 has been accepted for publication in a peer review academic journal. And those two people are here right now. Raise your hand. Rachel Dunham and Faith Scottman. And I currently have a, a, other members of the research group are collecting police and court documents for cases from 2014 to the present. We were just at the uh, Superior, Rhode Island Superior Court yesterday getting more documents. And I think we have one member in the group, Annie, back here, uh, who is part of the, the research group. And what we're going to be doing is looking at similarities and differences in the cases. Uh, particularly, we're researching the criminal histories of the sex traffickers. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing right now. Okay, we want to talk about uh, civil society response, which earlier we talked what the government response was, which is passing laws and then prosecuting cases. A civil society is what is considered the non-governmental sector. Uh, and this is an area that's also sometimes called not-for-profit or non-profit non-governmental organizations that uh, provide services to victims really all over the world. And these groups advocate and lobby for new laws against sex trafficking. Governments don't just automatically get the idea to pass laws. They're almost always advocated for by NGOs and advocacy groups that say we really need these kind of laws. And I think uh, Dr. Patkar is going to talk about the group that uh, he founded, Prerana. Right. In the year 1986, we came in contact with the red light area of Mumbai and then we decided that we are not going to leave this place until we change the situation there. The situation was terrible there. We'll come to that in details subsequently. What I just want to summarily say is that uh, as a part of this organization, for the last 30 years we have been working at various levels. And when I say various, I am saying from global to local and very actively. When this convention was passed, the first time it was discussed and before the General United Nations General Assembly in Austria on 12th of April and, uh, and four organizations were invited to speak before the UN General Assembly before the actual uh, protocol was put to voting and we were one of them and our view was considered that important there. Subsequently, of course, we have been a party to the changes in the Indian law as well as this, the regional we have a regional kind of a body called SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, made of eight countries, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Tibet, uh, Bhutan, not Tibet. And together we also have a 2002 protocol uh, against uh, trafficking. So we are very actively working on that. But here let us talk about what services we are giving. And uh, this, this is, you know, in a nutshell, we try to say that what we are doing is we are protecting rights because we consider that children, no matter where they are born and no matter who their parents are, no matter what is their economic and social situation, are born with certain rights and those rights must be upheld. There is no compromise on that. So protecting rights, creating options. We don't tell children or we don't tell women, don't become prostitute or become prostitute. We give them that sense of discri discrimination and we give them, make them opportunities available so that they have choices to choose from. So that is the second one. And the third one is, of course, restoring dignity because something like a sense of innate sense of justice, all human beings have that innate sense of dignity. And they consider that something is not simply acceptable to their sense of dignity. They can give it in writing like specific gravity or uh, conductivity. But everybody has a vague understanding about what dignity is and what is not dignified, what is dignified. And most of these, all of these women have always stated 
my children should not do anything that is undignified and that has anything to do with sex trade. This was, this clarity was very much there. We were just trying to restore their dignity where they have lost because as I said, most of these women have lost their childhood, they have lost their innocence, they have lost their right to choose life. And therefore our major work is to restore that, give, give them back their, their, their options and dignity. Uh, we would come to the specific services that we give for children, but let me mention very briefly. Of course, there is enforcement activity going on, but enforcement, if you see in most countries of the world, results into re-trafficking. There is a kind of a tokenism. There is raid, police raid, girls are withdrawn, they are kept in some kind of a home. By morning, they are declared to have run away from that home, or in two days' time, they are handed over to whoever comes to claim them. And most of the time, it is the brothel keeper and the pimp who comes to claim them. And government records are clear, the files are closed as successful, we, girls have been repatriated. In 24 hours, you find the girls back to the same place because the professional intervention that is required to protect them and keep them away from getting re-trafficked is missing. So we work on post-rescue operation. We do a lot of work with IOM, International Organization for Migration United Nations, for the economic rehabilitation of traffic victims, ERTV program. The traditional rehabilitation programs, if you see, are very archaic, non-professional and non-viable. What we have tried to do is that we have tried to change that into making something that is really professionally designed and delivered and which is actually market oriented. So we have a very good success rate on that front and our main f flagship program was ending second generation trafficking because the children who are born to the prostituted women in the red light areas had no choice in their life. And they lived a life which is horrible, indescribable and unacceptable, we will come to that. This is the situation of the mothers or women in the sex trade. Slaves don't own their body or soul. They are sold and resold. There were cases of women who were resold 13 times. If you Google for a case called Tulasa from Nepal, 13 times resold. 35% of the victims less than 18, of the 18 years of age as of today. But if you ask those who are adults, they will tell you that they were brought in the trade when they were 12, 13, 14, 15. They are homeless, there is no family, there is no father, there, is, there are no resources, they are illiterate, uneducated, unskilled. They are not allowed to open bank account because bank doesn't recognize prostitution as profession and unless you fill in that entry, you are not allowed to have. So all your savings are in the hands of your tormentors, your exploiters and they can arm twist you as you like and they will silence you because of that. No citizenship, children born, women have no paper to prove that they exist, they have no paper to prove their domicile, their citizenship, their nationality, nothing. As a result, entire, entire effort towards improving one's position in the society, economically, socially, politically, is negated, is denied to them. No ration card. Ration card is something like social security number in the United States. A ration card is your access to authorized ration shops where you get subsidized grains and kerosene and fuel and sugar and things like that. Sometimes even clothes, uh, cloth was given on, on, on those show, shops. You have to have a ration card which proves that you will stay in such and such place, this is your name, this is your family. That was also denied. In 1986, we started with that and started giving ration cards to all these women as their citizenship right. But as, and as a situation, they didn't have that. And they face stigma and discrimination. If these women walked into a public hospital, the hospital watchman would not allow them to enter. As a result, they were 100% dependent on local quacks who are completely unofficial, completely untrained, completely ill-equipped people who would handle their abortions routinely because these women would never benefit from medical termination of pregnancy and they would be repeatedly aborted because there were no such things as birth control measures known to them or ever taught to them. So women would have gone through six, seven, ten abortions and then becoming, you know, a, coming at a situation when they want a child, they are not able to conceive. Well, after 1986, we have been struggling with this one more problem and that is 40% are known HIV positive. We don't ask anybody to undergo a test. We don't ask what is the test result. When women share, we do that. And we encourage women to do that when the doctor says, look, the symptoms are very serious and she needs to find out what is her HIV status. Otherwise, but the, if you ask me, it is definitely far more than 65%. They are already HIV positive. There are several other sexually transmitted infections, communicable diseases, deficiency diseases. Uh, when they die, there is nobody to give them the final rights. They are put on the street and we have to arrange for their last rights also. So that is one of our activities to give them a dignified death and give them some kind of dignity after they are dead. No place to cook. So they all buy their food. Their children also buy food from outside. So very unwholesome 
and very dangerous food that they buy and spend a lot of money. They are forced into addiction. The customer would want to watch a blue film with that woman and he wants her to drink alcohol, then only he will have sex with her. So every nightly uh, forced alcohol makes them alcoholic and that affects their health. There is a lot of physical violence from customers, pimps, madams and police because the customer is the king and this trade actually cares for the customer and not for the uh, woman. The police also is a part of the crime, of course. I mean, no such organized crime can sustain unless the police is actively involved in that or making profit out of that business. This was the situation when we entered, of course, and women face 12 to 15 customers minimum every night. And I can tell you, if this is a brothel, there would be at least four courts in that, separated by a tattered linen, and that is all the privacy there is. And customers would be taking turns, and children of those prostituted women will be sleeping under the bed. Under the same bed, pretending to not to see anything, pretending not to hear anything. And they would be just like that in the middle of the night, but after four years of age, they will be driven out to find a place to sleep. Till the year of four, and newborn, do not get to sleep with their mothers. Newborn are given some kind of drugs so that by 6.30, 7 o'clock they are dazed and they get up only in the morning by 8.30, 9 or so and they don't disturb the customer. Lest they should disturb the customer, they are drugged every night which affects their physical growth, mental growth, emotional life, cognitive abilities, intelligence, everything is shattered and you have lots of problems with the children when you actually handle them at the age of 3, 4, 5. There is no family, there is just one mother mother does not know who the father is. There is a father figure which keeps changing because the mother will have different pimps acting as her husband. So they will keep changing, the father will keep changing and the girls and the boys are told that now it is this is your father. No home, no place to sleep, no home, no toilet, no education. Newborn I drug that time, 5 to 8 years children go are eranding for the customers and pimps and, uh, and the brothel ma keeper madam getting liquor, hard drugs, drinks. Many of these also arrange for blue films. They will have a, in the days when we started, they would have a VC player, video player, and they would go with the magnetic tape from brothel to brothel, arranging for shows, standing there to make sure that the show runs completely to the satisfaction of the customer, then go to the next brothel until 12.30 in the midnight, they would be doing that. All right. Beyond that, at a, a between 8 and 14, they will be looking for customers like pimps for their mothers and sisters. By 14, we don't know where they disappear. They are sold. They join the unofficial exploitative labor market of the city, but they don't come, the mother does not know where they are with the situation of the girl is terrible, you can imagine. We had so many girls who came to the center with semen in their mouth because the customer had forced himself on them several times, not once. So it is a very dangerous place for children and by the age of 13 or so you have pregnant girls there. you want to talk about there? Sorry? Anything you want to talk about no, there? No, I think oh. I'll, I'll If there are more questions, maybe we can. Okay. So in the year 1986, we realized that women were finding it very difficult to have their children around. It's very embarrassing thing that the customer is taking away your clothes and the child is watching. Nothing can be more embarrassing for a mother like than that. So all they wanted was that they should be at some place where we can get them in the morning again. And identifying that need, we started intervening and we said, okay, we'll look after your children. You give your child to us, we will sleep in the school morning come and take your child. They were not ready to believe because they had lost their children to so many people like that in the past. So they, they were justified in that. So it started with one child, slowly, slowly the number of children grew and we had, this was the world's first night crash and world's first night crash where children were kept at night time because their mothers were not around to care for them. And then we had a situation where we have a long waiting queue with 300 children sleeping in our school building and morning time handed over either to the parent, to the mother or we would send them straight to school. There were problems of getting them admission in school because the schools would say no admission if you don't put your father's name. So the case was taken to the apex court in the country and we got a ruling from the Supreme Court, we in the sense our partner honestly speaking, got a ruling that you can't ask that question who is your father. Without the, putting the name of the father, admissions must be given. And this night care center gave them all these facilities for the entire night, bath, Nutrition, recreation, role model, most important, adult supervision at night time. They were not sleeping on the road. Also protected their rights, including right to participation. So these children sit together with the doctor and a dietitian, decide what the whole month's menu will be like. That is their training in taking decisions. Okay. 
you can see them. They come, they have a bath, they have recreation, they have their food, they have play and lots of play. We call it 365 days of festival. So what we can, what we have done is that you know, in place of vagueness on their face, we have planted smile there. That is the only achievement we can say we have done. So this is what the night care, this is the flagship program. This is our just one of our 25 programs. But this was a very important program because this guaranteed that children of prostituted women would not be automatically trafficked into the sex trade or any other exploitative trade and their rights will be protected. So they have all these facilities at the night time also counseling, we have the child psychiatrists, pediatricians visiting them very regularly and we maintain their record. We have covered 12,000 children very comprehensively for which we keep files and detailed records about their health reports, educational record, everything. Okay. 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 Then we can switch back to Rhode Island and think about the conditions here. And one of the things that we know about the massage parlors, most of which are closed now, was that they were very dirty and dingy uh, places. I've been uh, in those uh, massage parlors. I've been to the door of a number of them where they wouldn't let me any further, but I got to sort of get a look inside. Uh, and they really look like I, I can't even imagine somebody wanting to go there, uh, but obviously men do. Uh, the women often sleep on the premises, uh, and uh, although, or if they do leave at night, they travel with the madam to and from the brothel. Uh, they are not out on their own, uh, living on their own. Uh, the will, women are seldom seen outside, uh, although they may be transported together to a beauty salon where they all get their hair done or something like that. But once again, they're all under the control of the madam. Um, they're moved together. Uh, all advertising is done online uh, in the prostitution ad sections, although previously there was an alternative newspaper that uh, ran a lot of the, the massage parlor ads. One of the things that you have to get used to is how is the surveillance cameras. Uh, they have numerous surveillance cameras all around the, the massage parlors. You can't get close to one without them knowing you are coming. Uh, when I've done some research, when you pull into the parking lot, if there's a parking lot there, you immediately see, uh, th they know, there's a camera there telling them that someone has moved into, into the parking lot. In some places where they have been on second stories, there's clearly a camera at the, at the bottom of the stairs and then one outside the door, so they see you coming. Uh, so because they are keeping an eye on who is approaching them. Now, most but not all of the massage parlors uh, in Rhode Island have been, have been shut down because of the new law and the new ordinances. But uh, the trade hasn't ended. Now they're moving into hotels, motels, and uh, apartments and residences. We think about the civil society or NGO response in Rhode Island. And one of the things that has had a huge impact on Rhode Island is that from 1980 to 2009, we had decriminalized prostitution in Rhode Island. And what that meant was that there were no laws or regulations on prostitution if it occurred indoors. Uh, and no one really thought there was a problem because it was invisible. Everyone assumed that the women were all consenting adults and uh, there were a lot of people making a lot of money and there just was seen as no problem. Uh, there were no centers for survivors or victims. That's one of the things that I think is a legacy of decriminalized prostitution. There was nobody there to start any kind of actions. In other parts of the United States, starting in the mid-1980s, uh, really as an outgrowth of the anti-battered women's movement, there were the beginning of uh, an anti-prostitution civil rights movement that was founded by victims and survivors. And they um, created centers, provided services for victims, got housing, they applied for a lot of grants, and started centers. That did not exist uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, in Rhode Island, so we really only had minimal services for victims. For a while, there was a small, uh, it's still operating, there is a small organization called Project Renew in Pawtucket that provides uh, re outreach to women who are working on the street. And then after 2009, uh, when they started to have sex trafficking cases, there was federal funds available for victims of trafficking. At first it was only for foreign women, now it's for domestic 
um, victims as well. Okay, I guess we wanted to just finish up here by uh, saying a little bit about where the movement's going. We know that we need a lot more services for victims. We know we need a lot more cases against uh, sex traffickers. Uh, we need a lot more prevention to prevent victims from being recruited. Uh, but one of the things that we just wanted to briefly mention, and that is that uh, the most important thing right now is trying to get a criminalization of prosecution of sex buyers. They really have been totally invisible. Uh, everyone talks about the victims. People even talk about the pimps or the sex traffickers. But very few people talk about the sex buyers. And that, uh, we feel, needs to be a focus now. Uh, in the status in the United States, buying sex as well as selling sex is criminalized, uh, except for a few counties in Nevada. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the status in, in the prostitution in India? Yes. Uh, it's very interesting to understand the, the relationship between the sex trade in India and the growth of law or the progress of law. In the year 1863, and between 1863 and 1864, Britain passed a law, Contagious Diseases Act. And that was made applicable to all colonies of Britain, also India. In 1865, Contagious Diseases Act became applicable in India, under which brothels were created by the British at the port cities, basically to cater to the commercial sex demand of the sailors and soldiers of the British Empire. As soon as they would arrive at the port, they would go looking for sex and the sailors and the soldiers would get sex officially provided under the law by the British administration and British administration had women whose job was to go around and collect women from nearby villages, make sure that they are clean girls and they are made available to the soldiers. It was the responsibility of the surgeon, British surgeon, to ask that question to a soldier if he is found infected with sexually transmitted infection as to point out the girl with whom he had slept. And it was the responsibility of the, it was the, he was responsible to identify that. It was obligatory on his part. And that girl then would be taken over from wherever she is. And she would be kept in a lock, in a hospital. The hospital would be locked. The British name for that hospital was locked hospital. And the girl would be kept there till she is declared by the surgeon as clean. And most of these brothel areas and red light areas were created by the British rule under this act at the port cities. And when the, sh when the soldiers are moved into the interiors, mainland area, there are cantonment areas. So under the Cantonment Act, once again, these kinds of ca red light areas were created by the British. So these red light areas and this organized sex trade had protection of law in the beginning. Subsequently, of course, after independence, it was all canceled. We had this 1956 law, and that was the first law. Remember, in 1956, the law said, if women are found offended, uh, doing prostitution, soliciting in public, public or doing any, you know, run, uh, found in a brothel, they are not to be punished, they are victims. So right from 1956, the decriminalization of sex sellers is a legal position of uh, uh, India. Indian law is only one law in the world which defines prostitution as commercial sexual exploitation. It is a sexual exploitation for a person or persons for a uh, commercial end. So basically prostitution was looked at as legally as an act of sexual exploitation. It penalized pimping brothel keeping, brothel managing, financing of brothel, detaining anybody, procuring anybody, uh, detaining in a variety of ways, even by keeping the document in your control if you are making sure that the girl would not run away, that's also an offense under section 6. And the only limitation was that if women want to solicit, they should not be very close to a school or an educational institution or a hospital or a place of worship. Now, in 1986, the definition, as I said, was made stronger. And in the year 2003, we had the basic criminal law, Indian Penal Code 1860, amended, and now buyers of sex are also punishable. The only thing is that it is stated that those who frequent or are found in brothels in or, you know, where and engage a victim of trafficking. So we are just arguing with the government right now. Why victim of trafficking? Any woman, if it is for that, like that, so that the the, the sex buyer category doesn't get restricted only to those who are buying sex from traffic victims. Okay? But that is the current situation. And uh, so legally right now we are more or less happy. And this is a very good uh, kind of a instrument as we have today. And the police has already started acting on these provisions. 
So uh, just to finish up, just briefly mention the name of the, the model that's being used to advocate for the decriminalization of women to view them as victims, uh, but to criminalize the sex buyers is called the Nordic model approach because it started in Sweden and has spread uh, to other countries uh, in a Nordic region, but is now being discussed uh, worldwide. So uh, with that, any questions or comments? is not a punishable offense. Her private premises, her own premises may not necessarily be private. You start a restaurant, it may be owned privately, but it's a public place. You start a beauty center, it is a public place because public is supposed to come in without taking a special permission like that. So in her real private premises, if she sells her bodily sex, not pornographic material, if she sells her bodily sex, not to the same sex person, to a buyer who is heterosexual buyer. So an adult woman in her private premises on her own, in her, uh, on her own, sells her bodily sex to a heterosexual customer, it is not a punishable offense. So this is recognizing the basic right of a woman to sell, to, to do what she wants to do with her sexuality. But she is not supposed to do that in public where people will find it annoying. So if there is a complaint of annoyance, there will be action against her. So basically, and what everything you saw in those pictures is illegal. All of this is illegal. All of this is illegal. Right, okay. But it doesn't sound, look like it was being prosecuted very accurately. Yes. It, it that seemed that to is, be happening. That is the problem. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Just, just, yes. just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. just to be clear. All right. And okay. I would say that we have a similar, somewhat similar situation in Rhode Island right. and the other states in the, in the United States. Absolutely. Um, maybe not to the, the, the extent or the density the red light districts in Mumbai, uh, but uh, we have the same kind of tolerance. See, there are several myths which support. People think that if some women are not subjected to prostitution in a, uh, in a place like this, every, every woman outside will be endangered, and there will be sexual assaults on them, which, which are very unfounded beliefs. But there are locals, there are visitors, there are tourists, there are tourists from certain countries which come under the pretext of taking medical treatment. For example, we used to have lots of people from the Middle East, Arabs used to come, by showing that they have come to India because in medical treatment was of good quality and cheaper. But actually, they would be booking in hotels, and uh, those hotels were known to be brothels, practically. Those types are also there. We have, uh, out of the 14 lanes here you saw, one lane is only for boys. It's only, you know, boy, boy uh, male sex, uh, sex trade. So we have all those types of visitors, visitors coming from other countries, of course. And uh, we have now, of course, girls, victim girls coming from uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. They moonlighting, they do moonlighting as prostitution. They will be also working as extra dancers in the film industry, which is very big in India. And then uh, they will be also doubling up as prostitutes. But buyers are from all over everywhere. Uh, there, is, there is prostitution activity happening in tourism places, such as beach-based tourism, where you find lots of British, German, Israeli, American tourists coming through chartered planes, going and booking, unfortunately, orphanages. They go have access to orphanages and have sex with children, toys. Big rackets of what is called as pedophiles, predators, child sex predators. It was on the last screen, it was saying in India, decriminalize the, the sex, the sex selling since 1956, and that was 56, 20, yes. 1956, and it was 2013, and it's still decriminalized. Yes. The selling. Sex buying in both the United States, where buying and selling is now decriminalized. Sex no, no, buying no, is decriminalized in India, and you both said that. You might get to the buyers. Who are these guys? Not the guys mostly. Um, every because the buyers seem every, like they're, they're every they're 
there is nothing special about them. They come from every economic class, every ethnicity, every race, um, all over the, every community. There is nothing specific about their, uh, their identity or where they come from. The profiling is <laughs> No, no, because they're, they come from everywhere, every strata. Because it seems like, I mean, not that anything really being done, but we're trying and you're trying. Yeah. Now, I, that I'll the say, buyers are the ones somebody, most at risk because yeah. that's the criminal act. Absolutely, yes. But in the United States, yes. both finance yes. only criminal act. But in Europe, I mean, in India, it is no, decriminalized see, to yes. sell. Yeah. But the buyers are the criminals and all. The Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They want to get into an act without taking the long term responsibility for what they are doing. Pardon? They are. They want to get into an act without taking the long-term responsibility for what they are doing. Sure. Absolutely, and that is precisely objectionable. You can't do something and let somebody suffer like that. You take the responsibility for what you are doing. You are passing on sexually transmitted infection. You are raping somebody against that person's uh, uh, consent. You are giving them uh, HIV, which is fatal now, and mm -hmm. the person will die. It's a and, and, and they, 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 they still want with all the risks. That a customer who is already mm -hmm. HIV positive has no interest in using condom. Why should he? Mm -hmm. So he just, and he is under the myth that if he can have sex with a virgin girl, the infection will be transmitted and he will be cured. If people are under this kind of a, uh, impression and myth, then they would go all the way and give this kind of you know, unsafe sex and dangerous transmission. Mm -hmm. So that is a demand factor that has to be affected. It's very recently now police has started. The intelligent thing that the government has done is that the trafficking definition was made a part of the main criminal law rather than a special law because the main criminal law is a law that the police station understands very well because they keep dealing with that law every day. It was made of a part of a special law the police station wouldn't have known what is the provision and how to use it. So that was one good thing that has happened. Same thing has happened, this provision to punish sex bias is also now a part of the main criminal law Indian Penal Code 1860 and not the special law. So police stations know now how to do, handle these ones. Yes. Ah, it sounds like a wonderful organization. And I was wondering, where do you get the funding for it? Is there government funding? Or? We don't take one single cent from the government because we want to keep our freedom to criticize the government, take action against the government, which we have been doing, which is a major part of our advocacy. Number two is that where locally nobody was inclined to support us. So a lot of our support came from Europe and USA. Charitable donations? From the? Is it charitable? Donations. Charitable donations, absolutely yeah. charitable donations. It's only last two, three years we have been also benefiting from corporate donations. Corporates were not interested in supporting this kind of a cause, but now I think they have changed and they are willing to support that. We have United Nations organizations, UNICEF, UNDP, UNFPO, UN, uh, uh, UNIFEM, uh, UNODC, they have been. We do a lot of training with the help of UNODC, United Nations Office on Drug and Crime. We are their consultant. We do the training of judges. We do the training of trial court magistrates, we do the training of prosecutors and lawyers and uh, police. On so the if, we wanted, we, if we wanted to donate, we could go to your website? Yes, we have. Yes. Maybe I'll be Can you say more about the impact the organization, your organization is having on the lives of the children? When they go from uh, um, uh, spending the night uh, going to school, having their meals at the organization, back to where the mother lives. Um, are they asking questions? Are they uh, realizing the condition the mother is under? Are they, um, is the, the, the risk that they would go into that um, uh, line of work diminished significantly? Uh, do they try to save the mother as they get older? Just wondering what there are. Yeah, there is a wide range of outcomes. Outcomes. Yes, yes. the wide range of outcomes. There are depending upon what kind of intervention you do. Two days ago, I received a letter I was sharing with her. One girl that we gave in adoption is now here in Minneapolis, and the <coughs> mother and her daughter together with three dogs and one horse together they sent a greeting card annually. I get a one greeting card saying we are so happy and we want to come and meet you. So some of those who have already been placed into proper families are doing very well. One. Number two. Our red light area is one area red light area under the sun where every child of a prostituted woman goes to formal schooling. Mm -hmm. Every child goes to formal schooling and we support the schooling to any extent. So we have now children joining for PhD. We have children who are completing their masters on a regular basis and we have children who complete their education as something compulsory practically. And depending upon their aptitude, their liking, their willingness, we help them with their counseling and other things like that. 
we did not find any single girl going back. Yesterday we just released because of eight months is coming very close. So we were just releasing some of the success stories. One of the success stories the girl wrote to me yesterday and I prepared her story a little compact. She said, I am working in a five star hotel now. I take a bus from my place to go to some, some you know, offices where I have to go. And in the bus, double decker bus, I pass through the red light area. I peep outside and suddenly, you know, a fear, a shudder kind of a goes down my spine. What if I had not been removed by you people? I would have been standing there today among one of those, or I would have been dead by now with some kind of infection somewhere. But we took them out, gave them education, put them for catering and hospitality trading. Now they are working in three-star, five-star hotels. I'm not saying that all of them have become doctors and engineers. And people say, so how many of them have become doctors and engineers? You say, perhaps none. But nobody has become a victim to uh, labor trafficking. Nobody has become a victim to sex trafficking. Nobody is now you know, without education. Nobody hates his woman, mother now. All of them want to have their mother back with them. And we have always protected. So much so that we have blacklisted organization which told us, we can take the child, but the mother should not come to see the child. We said, no, then we don't want you. Now, if you follow that, today we have children who regularly pass and we award and felicitate their mothers with the police commissioner will come, the state commission chairperson for women's, they will come and they will felicitate the mothers who have taken keen interest in careering of their children making sure that the children are protected properly. We take the children away, but we don't take the children away from their mothers. We try to you know, nourish that link, link. So educationally, they are doing very fine today. There are lots of supporters who want to take an you know, interest in their education. And uh, uh, we give them a lot of life skill education. It's not just a kind of a formal education, life skill education. Nobody has said that I want to become a pimp as my career. Nobody has said that I want to become a prostitute. Well, but that's not our, our uh, statement, that's their statement, their liking. And the most happy things are sometimes that my son who is now doing his master's here in the US, he did his computer science engineering and he did his internship and he, we sent him to one place for his internship because now the internship craze is very high everywhere in the educational institutions. He went there and he was given one supervisor to tell him how to do and how to go about the entire uh, computer work there. And that supervisor was one of the child, one of the children that from the red light area whom we had taken out and given training. And he was the supervisor for my son. Wow. So I think that is how the story changes. So many such stories are there. And you find that good, I mean nothing bad has come out of this. And they have their own groups, they have their own collectives, they come together, they sit together, they work on their problems very regularly. Um, may I find my picture? Um, in Rhode Island, you said the victims were from victims. Massachusetts, New York, I think it's Indiana and Texas. Why come to the smallest state in the union? To, oh. Is it? Is well, that's a, there's a very good reason for that. And that's smaller. because we had decriminalized prostitution. Mm -hmm. And everyone, all the pimps in the Northeast knew that. And so therefore, they brought victims to Rhode Island to be used in the strip clubs, uh, massage parlors, everywhere, because they realized that they were, they were not going to be arrested and, and punished. So that's one of the... That's one of the they knew that. The yeah, they knew that. I mean, that's why. And so there's still, uh, and so there's still trafficking. Uh, I mean, not that it's not that anywhere, but it's just like, why be coming here to that? The, the first case of sex trafficking in Rhode Island um, was a case of two men from New York who actually trafficked their girlfriends from the neighborhood to Rhode Island. And when they interviewed them, they said, well, we came here because it was decriminalized prostitution. Yes. Um, this is a question that I would like input from both of you, considering your specialties in different areas of the world. Um, do you think a system where we decriminalize and regulate and structure systems of sex selling would be beneficial enough to pursue? No. Why? The same reason, uh, because there's something inherently violating about the experience of having sex with multiple strangers every day. And there is simply no place where the conditions are good. 
even if you look at what's happening in the Netherlands and the, in Germany, where they have had legalized prostitution for about 15 years, the conditions that are there are absolutely horrible. Um, <coughs> The vast majority of women in the brothels are being trafficked from Romania and Bulgaria, uh, Africa, other places uh, of the world, and uh, the violence is just uncontrolled because men know that they can go there and legally treat the women any way possible. And even one of the brothel owners has now acknowledged, she says, what I'm doing is selling sexual violence. So no, I'm absolutely opposed legalization. One of the, uh, brothel owners in Germany. I'm proposing a system where it's legalized, but there are also like protections in place. Well, that's just it. They say there are, but now uh, what happened here with, in Rhode Island when there was decriminalized prostitution is the police couldn't go in to do, do, do investigations. It would be just like we are having a legal gathering right here. Police officers cannot walk in here, they might want to come in and see our program, but they cannot walk in here and start going around questioning us uh, because we're not engaged in any kind of illegal activity or even suspected illegal activity. And that's the way it was in the brothels, massage parlors in, in uh, Rhode Island. The police simply, it was a no-go zone because there was no legal reason for them to go to ask questions. What they're finding in Germany is the police are saying, well, it's legal now, we don't go. There's no reason for us to go in there. Everything that's happening is legal. Um, that's, that's right from the, the German police. Matter, and one of the things that's interesting is after they passed the, uh, legalized the uh, brothels in the Netherlands, particularly in Amsterdam, uh, the police officer that was in charge of sex trafficking investigations uh, resigned because sex trafficking was so out of hand. And if you read the reports done by the, the Dutch officials, they say that as a result of legalization, organized crime increased and the amount of prostitution increased because they may have had some regulatory control about the windows in central Amsterdam, but illegal prostitution was taking place in the um, apartments all around the city. So there are problems with legalization and which have not been actually considered seriously by the supporters of the critics also. And that is, uh, today nobody is demanding legalization actually, except for health officials in various countries. Nobody is really asking for legalization. Those who know what the whole business is like, they are asking for decriminalization. Because with legalization they realized several things will happen which are very unpleasant. Number one, there will be some registration process. So you have to come out and say, okay, I am the person, he is the partner, these are the girls. You will have to get them registered. Can you get girls below 18 years of age registered in the legalization process? You not. So they will be operating underground. Okay. Then, whether it is Amsterdam, most of them are Central and Eastern European girls, illegal migrants, smuggled migrants, whatever, okay, or traffic persons. Will they get registered? Will they be allowed legally to practice or to be kept in the brothel? No. So what will happen to them? They will go underground. Okay. There are others who are HIV positive. Because you have to take that precaution, basically you will not give certificate to a person who is HIV positive. So you will see, and if the person is positive, what will happen? That person will not get a certificate. That will, will she go? Where will she go? She came here basically because, basically because she had nowhere to go. Now where she will go? Who will look after her? The pimp or the brothel keeper? Out of what sentiment? So obviously all of them, so what happens is that immediately the underground industry grows biggest and you have only a small section that can officially be recognized. Then you will be paying taxes, there will be 15 departments of government which will come, shops and establishment, health department, income tax department, professional department, excise department, okay. so many departments will expect you to keep your returns and every time they will find some fault with that and you will have to grease their palms. So people realized. The general society realized, which happened in Germany once. If it is considered as a kind of a legitimate activity, you are in a queue because you have not got a job for a very long time. This happened with a woman. And then she got a letter from the employment authority saying that, look, such and such brothel as a place, go and work there. And if you decline the offer given, then you are not considered for further uh, employment because this is an employment now. Go and work. So there were several such dimensions. And people realized that we are not willing to pay taxes. We don't want 15 officers to come and knock at our place. 
we don't want to go through regular periodic medical testing. As a result, they gave up the idea of legalization. The only authorities all over the world who are actually asking for legalization are the health officials because they realize that only the police is making the money. Why not we? So moment it is meant, they have a huge scope. So it is the health department which asks for rest of the countries, all networks of pimps, brothel keepers, and what is called as sex workers, they are all demanding decriminalize. That means procuration should not be a crime, detention should not be a crime, brothel keeping should not be a crime, brothel management should not be a crime, pimping should not be a crime, decriminalization. That is the kind of decriminalization they are demanding today. And then you can, you know, you have to decide whether would you really like to go in for a situation or a system where pimping is allowed, soliciting is allowed. Your children are going to school, outside of the gate somebody standing there and want offering something saying that, well, if you come to my brothel two days, I'll give you a ticket to Alaska for a month. And you can't stop that person. And if you try to do that, that will be, that will be considered illegal. Thanks for coming to listen.